Hey there, friends, trolls, haters, woke individuals, the mature, solid America, Canada, and the world. Dave Politis, Canadian Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a missing persons only segment with some letters, some theories, some information to hopefully open your brain up to do some serious thinking about this topic. I was planning on being outside today and it's another one of those days where hours earlier it was 50 degrees sunny and now the wind is just ripping out there so unfortunately we're in the library again and there's a lot of things happening in the world that are of concern but what I'm going to give you today are some fascinating stories and I mean that and uh, we're going to start off with the letters so first of all we talk about being prepared for maybe shortages in the world, food crisis, things like that. Well, somebody sent in a fascinating free download. And if you looked at the pinned comment or the description of this video, if you click on it, the link is going to be there. And what it is, it's a handbook of medicinal herbs and it's a free download. I looked at it and it's really interesting. It'd be a good thing to have if you like going in the woods. Thank you for sending that in. On to the letters. Thank you for all you do, Dave. I'll keep this short. Talking about piezoelectric effects of granite in your March 16th video, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit behind, but I'm catching up, really interested me. The first line of an abstract I read says, the electrical properties of granite appear to be dominantly controlled by the amount of free water in the granite and by the temperature. Minor contributions to the electrical properties are provided by the hydrostatic and lithostatic pressure, structurally bound water, oxygen, fugacity, and other parameters. There you have your granite and you have your water linked, as I've stated all along. I promise to keep this short, but this might be a very big missing piece to my personal research on this topic. Thanks sincerely for sharing. Hope you find this helpful. I'll let you know if I find anything more, but I'm looking into how granite and water might be conducive to making portals. This might be a big key and I'm very excited about it. Well, as I've stated, friends, there's a lot of things I throw at you. And the people who aren't critical thinkers, it's just going to fly right over your head. And you're not going to put a lot of credit in what I'm talking about. These issues are much, much more complex than you think. There's not going to be a lot of easy, easy answers. Now, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, Joe and Tammy Hauser, own the Montana Vortex here in the Flathead Valley. We're best friends. Go over there all the time. Go to the Vortex all the time. Talk to Joe all the time. And I have yet to recommend that place to anybody and people not come away stunned because of how unusual it is. Joe has a camera set up inside this house of mystery 24 seven. And over the last several years, he's caught almost like a ghostly figure entering the vortex and then he's caught things that almost look metallic and have a definitive shape that enter the vortex somehow now they call it a vortex but in my mind it's some type of portal the reason i say that is is that the number of shapes and sizes that i've seen on his video come in there it's some of the most mystifying footage I've ever seen. It's, it makes Skinwalker Ranch look like a children's playground compared to what's going on at the Vortex. And I kid you not. So, 
we were over there the other night and Joe had called me and said that he sent me some photos that I'm not allowed to share of what he had on his screen and the best I could describe it is human type figure somewhat from the waist up no neck very big very muscular looking but a ghostly figure without definition and this had come in from a real bright light in one corner of the room that had no light and this had happened to him many times well this one had been going on and on and on and he said what do you think i said well how about if i come over i'm only a few minutes away so i'll come over so i came over there and Joe said, Dave, there's no kidding. As you're driving up, it went away. So he showed me on the time lapse, you know, as we're driving up, it, it goes away. <laughs> so we talked about it. We talked about these things at a high level. We've tried to do different things inside to instigate action. Suffice it to say, I'm 100% convinced it's probably one of the most unusual places in North America. And I kid you not. I'm not getting any money to say this. I'm just saying it. And I know Joe and Tammy are some of the most credible people I've ever met. And then he told me that before he bought the place, he had talked to the other owners. And they knew about some weird things that had gone, that, gone on in that home over the years. And then Native Americans had come by and said that this is a place where people disappear. And as any of you know who follow me, directly across the street from the Montana Vortex is Columbia Mountain. It's literally across the street. And I have written about someone who disappeared on the top of Columbia Mountain and missing 411 Montana. So, Joe's location has me intrigued in a big way. And I'll talk more about it as the years, as the months go on. But if you Google Montana Vortex or Joe Hauser, H-A-U-S-E-R on Facebook, you can connect with him and talk to him about it. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm not a big cattle mutilation guy, but some of the similarities with the 411 cases are eerily similar. I'm glad someone's paying attention. Both struggle finding a cause of death some cattle disappear from the same area ranch hands are working without a sound, return to areas they disappear. Dave, why would a government agency steal cows for experimentation and then return them? Why cause an unnecessary investigation returning them? If the government was involved, they just set up their own ranch with an endless supply. Some of the 411 victims, why return them? It doesn't make sense. The only conclusion I can make from whatever or whoever is available isn't human. And lastly, do you think there may be a connection with the two that the government is holding back on recovered 411 victims, such as a lock of blood in the cows? These two phenomena are connected, I feel it, but they are still mutilations occurring in your neck of the woods. Thanks for being a voice for the missing in our country. I've talked about this at length before, but I'll do it again. Mutilated cattle. Whoever can take them, takes them almost exactly in the presence of the people who keep them or maintain them, just like this man said. So they can take them at will and they can return them at will. But the question is, why return them? They're trying to send a message. They're trying to send a message. We may be too stupid to understand that message, but they're trying to send one. And it's probably something about the cattle. Are they diseased? Are they special? What is it? Hmm. Need to think hard about that because it is quite a conundrum. Now, the cattle are taken, and I have many cases that I've I have in this room right here where somebody was branding 20 cattle. One of the cattle walked away 20, 25 feet just over a knoll. 
20 minutes later, they go back. The cow is totally mutilated. Blood's gone. Everything's gone. They never heard anything. They never saw anything. They never felt anything. How can that be? <clears throat> exactly. I have other cases of missing people, and the parents said, my son was right next to me, and he disappeared. I didn't hear anything. I didn't feel anything. I didn't see anything. Hmm. Well, if whoever took the cow and nobody heard and nobody felt, saw anything, well, then those, whatever took the cow, could put the cow anywhere in the, in the world they wanted or put it on the top of a ridge 20 miles away and nobody would ever know that that was the cow that belonged on that ranch. So I think anyone who has spent any time at all on this topic believes there's some message that goes along with this. And maybe some of the people that own the cattle know what's wrong with the cattle and they don't want to tell us. Or maybe they just don't want to acknowledge there's something wrong with their herd. Now a friend of mine has family that own a big, big cattle herd. And they've had cattle disappear. They've had mutilated cattle, etc. And they won't tell anybody about it except family because they don't want a stigma going out to buyers and other ranchers that something's wrong with this herd. So they don't talk about it. Now, I'm in Montana. I'll go out on any cattle mutilation case. It still intrigues me greatly. I found a lot of weird things on animal mutilation cases that I have gone out on in Colorado. But I think the feeling of ranchers along the lines I just explained has kept the numbers of mutilated cattle down extremely low. The real numbers, we have no idea because they're not reported most of the time, probably 90% of the time. It'd be nice if everyone reported them, but the reality is they won't. But I hope I answered your question. And I agree, there's something peculiar there. Next letter. Hey Dave, read an email regarding the earth acting as a battery or a power source. My mind has been churning since you talked about that. I had to research this more and put much effort into the subject. And this is what I like about our village. I put something out there, triggers the mind to thinking, and some people get on it. Thank you very much. I found that throughout history, different people felt they could use energy from Earth for various needs, as some worshiped the use of such. Mainly, the indigenous people of South and North America often refer to Earth as the creator and the giver of life or energy. Now, my thoughts, if this is true, and the Earth is the reason we are and everything surrounding us in life, think about this. What if when and if explorers go to another planet, such as Mars, will the people die from lack of energy from Mother Earth? Are we, atta are we attached to the earth itself? If a human is abducted and taken to some other dimension or place, is that what kills the person? Due to the fact energy needed to exist <coughs> is not available, I'm basing this on the feeling that energy is what keeps everything alive. Without the energy, we leave our body which dies and we become a form of energy ourselves. When I was young, my grandparents were a great influence on me. My granddad taught the basics of life. We were given a mind to think, ears to listen, eyes to see, and a heart to be kind and respectful of life. They lived a simple life, a cabin in the woods they built, farmed, hunted, fished for food. Nothing fancy, just a peaceful life. I remember us sitting quiet in the yard, listening to the wind in the pines, the animals would wander right up to us, even deer as spooked as they could be. We never hunted near the home. 
always hiked a mile or more away. My grandmother could make a meal from whatever we came home with. Life was so uncomplicated, only 50 years ago. My grandparents would be devastated with all the anger in our world today. I'm grateful to be part of the village. We are grateful that you are here. It was an excellent letter. Now, to think that those locations and times still don't exist, that would not be true. There are many of those places out there. You have to get out and find them. They're going to be tougher to find, but are you willing to put in the price to get there? I know of several places in northern Montana that are so remote. I can get there within a reasonable period of time and see nobody all day. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Now, some of the most popular wilderness zones, yeah, they get a lot of traffic. But the further you get from civilization, the farther you drive, the farther you're willing to hike, the less people you'll be willing to see. And the further you're willing to hike, the bigger the dividends. And dividends, I mean, the fishing's better, the wildlife sites are better. It's just phenomenal. Thanks for that. Hey Dave, I have a story to tell you to this day. I still try to wonder what exactly and how exactly it happened. I was living in New River, Arizona. This was 1995. My neighborhood was always quiet and the houses are spread out about 150 yards from neighbor to neighbor. The gentleman living next to me was a retired City of Phoenix worker and he had three black labs. I myself at the time had a Queensland healer he was a very energetic and loving girl named Nahia. It wasn't uncommon for my dog to park occasionally at whatever caught her eye. One night, approximately 11.30, I was awakened to my dog barking and whimpering like she was in distress. I thought something was seriously wrong and rushed to the living room where she was covering, cowering behind the couch. I'd never seen this behavior and I was very concerned thinking something was wrong. Maybe 20 minutes later, my neighbor is knocking and ringing my doorbell. I open the door and see him standing in his PJs and he's frantically asking if I could help him search for his dogs. He said, they just vanished. I have no idea where they are. I asked if they got out of the gate and he said, it's not possible. The gate is always locked and there's no way for them to get out. I walked with him over to his house and I checked the back gate. It was locked and there was no way the dogs could get out. The fence was wooden. There was no breaching of the fence anywhere. He said prior to discovering the dogs missing, he heard them barking very aggressively. When he went to check on them, they were gone. I could see and hear in his voice how frantic and completely baffled he was. I was still trying to process what exactly was going on. I suggested calling the sheriff, and after a few minutes, we went into his house and he called. I opened the Acadia door, and there was no dogs in the backyard, no dogs in the house, no dogs anywhere. The police were called and decided to drive around the neighborhood looking for the animals. It was dead quiet. There was nothing around. I was feeling terrible for my neighbor, and every turn I was hoping we would see them trotting down the road. We get back to his home, and as I was closing my car door, I can hear what sounds like dogs whimpering and barking like your dog would do when they got home from work. My neighbor took off for his front door like a bolt of lightning. I followed behind him, and as I entered his front door, I could see the Acadia door open, and he was back there with tears of joy hugging and petting his dogs. I started petting them too, and they were perfectly fine. Like they were just waiting there all this time, but they weren't in fact not there. I saw it for myself. Those dogs were gone. This wasn't a prank. It wasn't a theft. I have no idea what happened. It was the strangest thing I have ever and will ever experience. We never really talked about it after that. I think we just both had a mutual feeling of fear and being completely baffled. A Maricopa County Deputy Sheriff arrived a bit later, and after explaining all this to him, he looked just as baffled as us. I was wondering if he ever thought we were on drugs or something. Nothing like this ever happened again, thankfully. He never kept his dogs out overnight. Thank you for your time, Dave. I'm not a professional writer, so I hope I explain this strange event well. Have a blessed day.
appreciate that letter for a couple reasons. Number one, in Missing 411 Eastern U.S., I wrote a series of stories about children who disappeared from Pennsylvania, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the majority of those disappeared with a dog. I would say the majority of the time the dogs didn't come back, about half the time the kids would come back, and about half the time they'd be alive. They didn't have a memory. There's been a lot of talk in UFO circles about canines and UFOs. And there's been a lot of talk that maybe there's some interest by the UFOs in canines for some reason. I don't know. Uh, I think the court's still out on that decision. I will say that when dogs disappear, we tend to think, oh, they ran away. We tend to place logic on their disappearance. Yet, maybe as this ha happened, maybe as we think a portal took some people, Maybe we can think that a portal took a dog or aliens or whatever. I don't know. But thanks for the story. As I sat down to eat dinner alone, my new normal now being an empty nester. It's a new letter, by the way. I turned on the TV to see if you had posted a video today. To me, sitting down eating dinner, watching your videos feels like sitting down to dinner with a friend who helps inform me of things going on in the world. Tonight's video really touched me. Well, thank you. Here's why. When you make your videos, you're helping spread awareness about missing people, people you don't know. You spread awareness about mental health. You show compassion and urge people to be aware of their surroundings. You've shared the loss of your son with this community and the struggles he has gone through. Today you celebrate your son's life in a way many of us hope to never have to. I pray you never have to. You celebrate his life by talking about his life. As I sat and listened to you, and now I'm reaching out to let you know I heard you. I'm celebrating Ben's life with you. As someone in your community who doesn't know but looks to you as a friend to have dinner with, you're on the right path, Dave. Making a video talking about Ben, celebrating Ben with your YouTube community helps not only the people watching the video, but also helps you. Your mental health is just as important as others. The only way to stay strong and be the beacon of hope is for you to talk about it. You have shown me and many others how to stay strong and share your love for others. The least I could do is to reach out to you and let you know I heard you. I prayed tonight, which is not something I do all that often. But I prayed to God that he send you strength to keep your journey in this life. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your village and sharing Ben's life with you, your friend. Thank you. Many days. I end the day. Feeling like. Sometimes pretty lonely. Like I've told you guys in the past, I, I called Ben often. We talked about everything in the world. He was my go-to guy. Yeah, I miss that. Next letter. My name is Eddie. I'm originally from El Paso and moved to California in 2012 when I was 19. I worked for Stanislaus County Emergency Medical Services. I've been an EMT on a 911 ambulance for about seven years. The reason I'm reaching out to tell you a little bit about myself and to share an odd and frightening experience I had in Yosemite a couple of years after I moved. When I moved to this area, I was captivated by the Sierra Nevada mountains. I spent a lot of time exploring the Sonora Pass and the areas surrounding Highway 108. I also love Yosemite although I have not spent as much time there as I'd like to. I love camping, and my biggest hobby is off-roading and rock crawling, neither of which you can do in Yosemite. So because of that, I don't often go and do as I do in Sonora Pass in 108. 
I've driven and explored a lot of those native roads and areas throughout the years. I just very recently found out about you. A friend mentioned your documentary to me, so I watched The Hunted, Missing 411, The Hunted, on YouTube, where you interview Ron Moorhead and share the Sierra sounds. I'd never heard of him or his recordings. I found it fascinating. I watched that part of the documentary and the part about Donnell Lake Vista disappearances multiple times, and I'm extremely familiar with the area. As I said, I've been captivated by that area for years, so much so my wife and I have taken steps to move our life up there. My wife actually works for the hospital in Sonora now in the ER, and I'm hoping to transfer to Tuolumne County Ambulance by the end of the year. We also just recently purchased a cabin house in Miwok Village, which is about 35 miles down the hill from Donnell Lake on 108. I frequent Donnell Lake quite a bit. I actually attached some photos I have of the area. Well, I actually printed out one of the photos that he gave me, and it is gorgeous. Now, if you watch Missing 411 The Hunted, uh, part of that includes a series of disappearances at an overlook at this lake. It's on Highway 108 in California in the Sierra Nevada mountains, just outside of Yosemite National Park. Now, if you notice, a lot of boulders, a lot of granite around this area and the lake is pristinely beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful. And the people that have disappeared there have disappeared on a vista surrounded by boulders. Watch Missing 411, The Hunted, and I go into it in detail. Uh, there is an extremely remote waterfall there that hardly anyone knows about. Even a lot of locals are unaware of it. The vista gets so much attraction and is so beautiful that not many go out into the woods. The waterfall also happens to not be visible, visible from the vista. I discovered this place with my buddy by accident. We actually got lost and stumbled upon it a couple years ago. There's no real trail to get to it. And kind of like the Sierra Camp, if you don't know where it is, you'll never find it. That's for sure. I took this just a couple weeks ago during a quick overnight camping trip with my friend. The area, the photo I just showed you, is very beautiful, but it is also very strange. I'm not a superstitious person, but I am a Christian, and I believe there are things in this world beyond our comprehension. I've never really had a paranormal encounter other than sleep paralysis once in my life, and the strange thing that happened in Yosemite that I will get to. That being said, every single time I go into these mountains, particularly this area, I get an eerie feeling. I don't know how to describe it, but honestly, besides the beauty, that is what captivated me in the first place and keeps me coming back. Beauty and the mystery. I felt this way for years. This is particularly why I felt so compelled to reach out to you because Ron Moorhead said the same thing in your video. I can't believe I had ever heard, I can't believe I had never heard of him or you, but I'm very excited that I did and be sharing this with you. So many people have never heard of us or Ron. The information's being suppressed, obviously. They don't want the word getting out there. Back to the email. So now we get to my experience in Yosemite. It was in August of 2013. My girlfriend at the time and I decided to take a backpacking trip out of there. We wanted to be in a more remote area, so after taking to one of the, talking to one of the rangers while getting our wilderness permit, we decided we were going to hike to the Polydome Lakes via Murphy Creek Trail. If you're unfamiliar with the area, the trail that is basically across the street from Tioga Lake at 9,000 feet, pretty remote. Most people don't like that trail because although it is beautiful, there are a ton of mosquitoes. Anyway, as we made our way up, we crossed paths with another hiker on his way out. Once we got there, there wasn't another soul around. Everything was fine all the way up to our campsite. We didn't encounter, any, encounter anything unusual. I did see a small black bear from about 60 yards away at some point and we found a freshly killed deer carcass a couple miles away from the lakes. We camped and set up our tent in a large boulder field. Mistake number one. Right up against a boulder that was probably five feet tall. Going into the night, we had a campfire. We ate dinner and everything was fine. We went to bed around nine or 10. We both fell asleep pretty fast as we were tired from being in the sun and exploring. 
around two or three in the morning, I was very rudely awakened by the sound of a woman screaming. Now let me say, between two and four a.m., that's like the witching hour for odd things to happen in the wilderness. And many religions of the world think between 3 and 4 a.m. you're closer to the spirit world during those hours. So around 2 or 3 in the morning, I was really awakened by the sound of a woman screaming. And I mean like blood-curdling screams, literally the stuff of nightmares. I don't think I've ever been so acutely frightened in my life or felt what I did that night. And mind you, I've worked in EMS for seven years. I've heard the screams of mothers who lost their children and countless family members who lost loved ones in tragic ways. Still, I've never heard anything like that to this day, eight years later. What scared me most was that I thought originally it was my girlfriend. I thought that maybe she had gone to the, use the bathroom and was attacked by a bear or something. There was no moon that night and it was pitch black, so I couldn't even see her next to me. I scrambled to feel around the tent and when I felt her body Next to me, I was relieved for a moment that it wasn't her, but still couldn't believe what I had heard. The screams lasted for probably five to six seconds. By the time I felt my girlfriend was there and woke her up, it had stopped, so she didn't hear it. The original plan was to stay there for three days, but I was so spooked that the next morning I packed everything up and dragged my girlfriend out of there and we spent the next two days in the valley and just did some of the shorter popular day hikes. To this day, I haven't been back to that area, although... Now, at this point, I would really like to. I know it's probably nothing compared to the things you've investigated or stories you've heard from others, but I wanted to share it with you. I thought you might appreciate it coming from the fellow public servant and somewhat now local to the area. just want to finish by saying that I'm really fascinated by your documentaries and some of the videos I've seen and really appreciate what you are doing. These people's families deserve to know what happened to their loved ones, and we as citizens do not deserve to know the truth. I will be purchasing and reading your books, and I look forward to hearing from you. If you're ever in the area and would like to be shown around, I'd be happy to take you to some of the more remote places I've found in the Sierras that are really only accessible by built and capable 4x4 vehicles. This letter was really only intended for you, but if you want to share my experience on your YouTube channel, feel free. Thank you. Many people, if you're new to the wilderness, not this guy, but if you're new to the wilderness and you've never heard a mountain lion wail, mountain lions can sound like screaming women. But, but, people who know what a mountain lion sounds like and then hear a screaming woman, they definitely know the difference. What's going on there? I don't know. But a lot of times people have reported that when they are asleep in a tent and they hear something odd, that their spouse or their significant other in the tent with them isn't awake and they don't wake up in time to hear it. I've heard this many times from people in homes, in tents. It's almost as though the person next to them is drugged or something and you can't get them up to hear what you just heard. Now, what did this person hear that night? I don't know. But they were in a boulder field, and cats like big boulders. But there's also a lot of weird things and paranormal things that are associated with boulder field, as you know. So thanks for that letter. Very interesting. Hello, Mr. Politis. I want to share with you something that hasn't or that isn't a very common theme in human nature in today's reality. Yet I've seen this enough through you, and not just throughout your work and documentaries over the years with the victims and their families, but even more in the past several months. My heart aches when I see you get emotional, but I also, something else happens when I see a, gro a man growing and processing. As a mother, I could never imagine the pain and belief that has got to be the most horrific, terrifying experience as a parent to ever go through. Sir, my heart, prayers, and thoughts go out to you, his mother, and your whole family. I've always admired a man who can show his emotions and cry. It is something we don't see that much, yet it's one of the most healthy possessions 
for our body and soul. I believe throughout time on this planet, the idea of a man showing and releasing emotions has been portrayed as a lack of manhood, a weakness, or even worse, made out to be a girly man. If you tap into that and if showing emotion or being a girl or woman is bad, hopefully we as a human race are turning over a new leaf. You, sir, are an outstanding example of a human being coming from a career you've held in law enforcement, creating these amazing books and documentaries with a very matter-of-fact, straightforward outlook, honest and being very wrong and genuine. I want to take this time to point out to you the effect that you are having on so many. And I believe you are a shining example of first and foremost, a father, a person in the media, an all-around stand-up honest guy. You see through and past the superficial things as well as help the community look and question everything that helps most everyone be safe. Yet you also make time to see the beauty in Mother Earth. A couple of videos ago I saw you light up when the video was recording and you get all to hear the Osprey call out that day. That was amazing and a once in a lifetime catch. It was very stellar. You're doing much more for this world, Dave, than you think. I just want to send you a letter of gratitude and let you know that we are listening and sharing, showing the world to you and much more in these short videos than you may ever be aware of. Mr. Politis, I know these times are of the charge, meaning suicides, mental health, etc. And yes, I believe they are not letting the public know or come aware of how bad it truly has gotten these past months to a year. I too have a family member that suffers from bipolar and she took a drastic turn for the worst in late December. In fact, she has changed and done things that I can't even repeat, things that most could would classify as a drug addict off the rockers, when in fact she was sober throughout all of this. I know that she has been turned away from her local hospital so many times that I've lost count. She has resorted to living on the streets, no homeless. She's walked away from a beautiful marriage, two amazing boys, and a thriving business. The only help and guidance we've received is from NAMI, N-A-M-I, and thank God for them. As the doctors at the hospital tell us, they are not equipped to handle her and her needs for treatment. We're even turned away through the courts with the judge telling us, quote, this sounds like a marital dispute, end of quotes, and just turn my friend away. But as you are well aware of, it is up to her to get herself checked in somewhere, and that could take years, if ever. There is a problem in this country, in fact, the world, and nobody is talking about it. I've dove deep into every aspect, even as far as watching the flares of the sun and checking their webpage to watch the CMEs and see if there's a link there. I don't have the answers, but hopefully people like you, Steve, and a few more can make our own truth community stick together and help one another. Thanks for your time. Whew, well, that's a, I've been there. I had a psychiatrist tell us that when you have a bipolar relative in your house, that one day they could walk out and you may never see them again. I said, what? They said, yes, yeah, sometimes they get an urge to leave and be on the street. And psychiatry can't explain it the right way at this point. And they said, the best thing you can do is to do everything in your power to keep them close in the home and protected. And as I've stated before, there was a point where Ben got manic and my ex-wife and I lived with him, moved to LA and stayed with him at his apartment 24 seven. It was one of the most trying but unbelievable times of my life. He, he had the energy to function 21, 22 hours a day when in, in his normal life he slept 10, 12 hours a day when he was an athlete. It's only a couple of years later. And during those manic, manic stages, he could walk you into the ground. I can remember some days we walked 10, 12, 14 miles. He wasn't tired. He didn't get tired. I'm, there were times when I told him, Ben, I have to sleep. Please don't leave. Hold my hand. And he needed to hold my hand. And I'd say, look, look me in the eyes. Do not leave this apartment without me. He said, I promise, Dad. And he didn't. 
then when I woke up, we just <laughs> walked miles. But knowing that he could walk out that door and become homeless it scares the heck out of you. And these people are 100% right. The courts don't offer you any support. They'll say, well, they're an adult and they're making decisions. There's a lot of people that live on the streets. Nothing illegal about that. So we can't hold them. He's not a danger to himself. He's not trying to kill himself. He's not going to hurt others. And that is the screwed up reality of our system today. And in truth, there's no place to put them. There is no facility out there that can hold the masses that are in these conditions. Just as this lady said, but why all of a sudden the massive number of people with mental illness yeah, I attribute a lot of it to COVID. And even the powers to be have said that COVID has propagated many mental health cases. It has. It's very scary. Very scary. So, let me go into the cases today because there are some winners here. And I'm going to try to pull in some peripheral things on this first case. First incident involves a man named John Schneider, 32 years old. He went missing October 17th, 1926 at 5 p.m. That was a Sunday. He lived with his family in Detroit, Michigan, and he was the first mate on a lighthouse tender boat named the Amaranth that was on Lake Superior. On October 17th, the Amaranth anchored in Siskiwit Bay on the island Isle Royal. Now this is important. You should all recognize Lake Superior. I've said this a hundred times and here goes 101. This is where the Air Force jet fighter took off, scrambled about a UFO called for by Canada and disappeared over Lake Superior and never was found right about here. There's a whole series of hunters missing here, here, and here. And this area of Ontario has people missing. Isle Royal is an island in Lake Superior. This is the US Canadian border, US down here just inside of Canada. It's a national park. Beautiful. So now you kind of have the fundamentals. So he's on this light lighthouse tender boat, the Amaranth, and what they go around is they resupply all of the lighthouses on the lake. And when they get time and they anchor in a protected area like Siskiwit Bay, John decided he was going to spend his afternoon hunting. So he got off the boat, went out at 5 p.m. He's due back. He didn't come back. So the boat sent a couple people out looking for him. Couldn't find him. Shot off a couple rounds. Didn't hear anything in return. And on the following morning, they started to look for more assistance. Well, they got a hold of four strangers on the island. They also got a hold of some game wardens. And the Coast Guard was called. And quickly, they had 25 people on the ground in the area where he disappeared in the bay. So, this is a close-up map made by the National Park Service of the island, Isle Royal. So they were anchored in Siskiwit Bay. John went ashore, and this was the area where they were searching. Now, have you ever heard of a Windigo? W-I-N-D-I-G-O? Well, so the distance across the island here was about seven miles. And the farthest northern 
area they were searching was just a couple miles from the Windigo region. This is what I'm going to talk to you about. But before I get there, so the 18th, they called for more assistance. They immediately got it. On the 23rd, they re had already requested and they got bloodhounds from Houghton, Michigan that arrived at the island and were searching. Well, also on the 21st, the U.S. Coast Guard placed a crew on shore to search. And one of those members, one named A.H. Warner, on October 21st, was part of that crew that went ashore. But he didn't come back that night. And of course, they started to search. And they didn't, he didn't come out. Fired a bunch of rounds, he didn't come out the next day. Searchers are now looking for two people. How weird. A searcher disappeared. So on October 23rd, late that afternoon, out of swampy timber, Warner walks out, missing two days. Now they're still searching for Snyder. They're not having any luck. So on the 26th of October, the Amaranth went out and they had to continue to supply the lighthouses. On October 29th, the formal search and rescue for John Schneider was terminated. Now, the park rangers and the game wardens that worked the island continued to look for him casually in that area. But he was never found. So, there was a lot of water in this area. They called it a swampy, thick forested region. He was a hunter. He was a subgroup of the missing. He was German. And canines that were brought in from Houghton, Michigan, never found him. Now let me get back to the Windigo. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, a Windigo is a supernatural being belonging to the spiritual traditions of the Algonquin-speaking First Nations in North America. Windigos are described as powerful monsters that have a desire to kill and eat their victims. In most legends, humans transform into Windigos because of their greed or weakness. Various indigenous traditions consider Windigos dangerous because of their thirst for blood and their inability, correct that, and their ability to infect otherwise healthy people or communities with evil. Windigo legends are essentially cautionary tales about isolation, selfishness, and the importance of the community. Definition. According to most Algonquin oral traditions, a Wendigo is a cannibalistic monster that preys on the weak and socially disconnected. In most versions of the legend, a human becomes a Wendigo after his or her spirit is corrupted by greed or weakened by extreme conditions such as hunger and cold. In other legends, humans become Wendigos when possessed by a prowling spirit during a moment of weakness. Appearance and characteristics. Just as there are different versions of the word Wendigo, there are many variations on the creature's appearance and powers. Sometimes Wendigos are described as exceptionally thin with the skull and skeleton pushing through ash-colored mummy-like skin. Other stories describe the Wendigo as a well-fleshed giant who gets proportionally larger the more it eats. According to other legends, the Wendigo has pointed or animal-like ears with antlers and horns protruding from its head. A Wendigo's eyes have been described as sunken and glowing like hot coals. Sharp and pointy teeth, extremely bad breath, and body odor are often, often traits. It's usually but not always endowed with powers such as superhuman strength and stamina that allow it to stalk, overpower, and devour its victims. Wendigos are usually credited with exceptional eyesight, hearing, and sense of smell. They are said to move with the speed of the wind and have the ability to walk across deep snow and even over open water without sinking. According to some legends, Wendigos can be killed with a conventional weapon, 
such as a club or firearm. Other legends claim that the Wendigo has to be somehow subdued, its icy heart cut out and then melted in a roaring fire. Still other legends claim that only the knowledgeable First Nation spiritual leader, a shaman, can dispatch a Wendigo. <coughs> Which is why I brought up that Wendigo segment of the island, especially since Schneider disappeared adjacent to it. Can't leave that out. Now, other people have misused that word Wendigo to also claim a Wendigo is a Bigfoot, which according to legends it's not, but if you go into some areas, they're still gonna call a Bigfoot a Wendigo for what it's worth. Now, whatever happened to A.H. Warner was never stated. It was never publicized. It was just like he was lost, he was found, boom, over. But oftentimes people ask me, well, Dave, have other searchers been lost? Of course there have. Have others never been found? Yes. In this case, Warner was found, lived. Next incident. <coughs> This one's a humdinger. Put your feet up, grab your coffee. Personally, I'd grab an almond croissant, that's just me. Maybe a glazed donut cruller, and that's just me. Coffee with some cream and some stevia, I'm set. Story involves a lady named Benny, B-E-N-N-Y-E, Whitney, 83 years old. Her birthday was November 6, 1888. She was born in Butler, Missouri. Lifelong resident of Bates County up until just the end of her life. She was a very, very committed member to the United Methodist Church. She had two sons, Robert and Walton. She had four grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Her husband named Chester died in 1953. Now, I apologize that this isn't a great picture, but this is what Benny looked like near the end of her life. She had a brother that was a physician that lived in New Mexico and owned 60 acres in the far northern part of the state. And <clears throat> she went out to live with her son in New Mexico. And she had lived out there about three months. Her son was a retired Air Force major. Her brother was a physician. And on June 17, 1972, they went to the brother's property in an area called Amalia, New Mexico. Far far northern part of New Mexico, right near the Colorado border. And they were near an area called Ute, U-T-E Creek. I'll show you. So, map. Right down here is Taos Ski Resort of New Mexico. And this is the search zone. This is Amalia, the red dot. Search zone and the campsite was about three miles from Amalia northeast, very near the California, the Colorado border. <clears throat> so, her brother's family, four people, her son and his son and her all went up for a big camping weekend. And they all got there, they set up the camp, and the people, a lot of people hadn't been there before. So at about 2.30, they decided to get in the car and take a tour of the area, and Benny's brother was gonna drive around and show them the area. Benny didn't wanna go. She said she was just tired, just wants to hang out and get in camp, get it all situated for everyone. They said, okay, we'll be back in a couple hours. Well, the brother owned 60 acres. It was a nice piece of property, very nice area. 
high elevation, about 9,000 feet. Now, if you are not used to being at 9,000 feet, you're not going to have a lot of stamina. It's going to make you out of breath very quickly. Now, I lived in Colorado at about 6,500 feet for 10 years. I got pretty well acclimated to elevation. But if you're not, you're coming from like a couple thousand feet, and all of a sudden going to 9,000, it's going to hit you hard. Well, Benny was 5 feet 2 inches tall, 85 pounds. She wasn't overweight. And everybody said that she was in good shape. She didn't hike. She didn't do those kind of things. But she didn't have any real huge medical issues. They did say that she had just the early signs of being forgetful. Didn't describe her as dementia or Alzheimer's. So at about 4.30, 5 o'clock on the 17th, June 17th, 1972, the family comes back to the campsite and Benny's gone. They yell, look around. One of the family members thought that when they were driving up, they thought they saw a lady walking over a ridge about a half mile from the site. So everyone went over there and they spread out and they looked around, they couldn't find her. And they're really nervous. They're looking for signs of animal predation. They're looking for anything and they can't find it. So they call the state police, in New Mexico. And in New Mexico, the state police run the search and rescue operations. They do a really good job. I've gotten a lot of reports from them and it's very professional. So the state police call St. John's College and get a, a number of college students out there. They get a National Guard helicopter and it comes out and they start searching. And then they get the local Air Force base to contribute members. Now on June 22nd, it rained and it hailed hard on searchers. One of the state police on June 22nd was interviewed and they said, well, it's been five days and you haven't found anything. And you've had three different canine teams from the state police here and you haven't picked up a cent. What's going on? State policemen made this quote. It's a real mystery to me. You would have thought by now we would have found something. But we found nothing. That's a, that's a pretty strong comment for a state police officer. And even in 1972 to be saying that. Well, they gave it a big effort. Eight days. Over a thousand people. Including Kirtland Air Force Base that sent a series of soldiers in to scour the landscape. So, it was noted that Benny had, she was hard of hearing. She wore glasses, so she was somewhat hard of seeing. And she had early memory loss. So she had some serious disabilities. They brought in, by the best guess, I had five or six different canine teams and they never picked up a scent. The weather changed for the worse, rained, hailed. She was never found. Now the family got together and through the state police they put up a reward and it was talked about in the press and that reward was to get people to go out into the woods and try to find Benny. She never found. So the state police made a comment <coughs> near the end of the search that they didn't think that the family saw Benny half mile away walking over a ridge from where they were. Because the search and rescue coordinator said that is entirely too rough for a woman of her age to make it that far in that period of time. So it was discounted. 
So a woman, 83. Some accounts said she was 83. Other accounts said she was 84. How far could she go? She's got to sleep. she got to rest. If she died on that mountain, she would give out an extreme odor that cadaver dogs could pick up. But how could soldiers not come across her? It's baffling to me. When I first found this case, and I was starting to do the research on it, I said right away, oh, they're going to find her because she's not going to be able to travel too far. It's a very similar case to an incident I wrote about in Idaho where an elderly woman that was disabled was left at a campsite by their family as they picked berries and they came back and that woman went missing and was never found. Very similar scenario. That story is in Missing 411 Idaho. I can only think of the weight on her son and her brother that they couldn't find their sister and their mom and all the grandkids. Very troubling. But we covered three people who disappeared. One person came back alive, two people didn't. Two people never found. John Schneider, 32 years old, missing October 17th, 1926 from Isle Royal in Lake Superior, Michigan. And Mrs. Benny Whitney, 83, missing June 17th, 1972 far northern reaches of New Mexico near Amalia, A-M-A-L-I-A. -A. You could do me a huge favor. You could take this video and post it on your social media sites. Share it with people you know who are hikers, explorers, young people too. Even tell people that the number one thing you should be carrying when you're in the woods all the time is a personal locator beacon. Get them at most outdoor stores. Look up and read the reviews on Amazon, Personal Locator Beacon. Read the different reviews. And from those reviews, make a decision about what you need, what you want. Some of those PLBs are waterproof, some are not. Make your own personal decision. I don't recommend any. But I'm very grateful that I have you as an audience. For without you, this show would not exist, truthfully. When and your letters give insight that I could never, ever supply in whole as you have. So thank you very much. If you have mental illness, I talked about NAMI today, N-A-M-I. Please listen to that review. They help that family immensely. They can help you. So give them a call. In the meantime, Thanks for being here. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Lastly, make sure you're subscribed and don't ever buy a Missing 411 book online other than from our site. And the site will be listed under the description of the video and the number one comment on this video that's pinned will have the location of our website. You have a great week. Do something nice for somebody when you're out in the public today. Politis out.